start off with that. I like that little remote control there in the lights. It's very spacey. Show us, please. Uh, let's see. What can you see in the background? Why? I got everything. You got all the roof, the, the flashing on the ceiling. Oh, there you go. Yeah, this is amazing. Everything's white. I love it. Fantastic. Is is that in your home, Ace, or is that a studio outside? A basement. Yeah, that's what I thought. It looks like a basement. Ace, I need cool. a basement like that. Yeah, I, when I bought this house, it was completely, absolutely nothing. And uh, I built a drum room over this way, which is double walled and is soundproof totally. And then this is the control room. And I always like big control rooms because uh, I've learned over the years that a lot of the recording all happens in here. You know, I got my amps here and, you know, the speakers are in the other room with microphones and the microphones come in here to the preamps and then they go into the hard drive, you know, via Pro Tools. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's like a it's yeah. a command center, and then you got the Stargate in back. Yeah, it looks like USS Enterprise. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, I'm kind of a I'm kind of guy who thinks outside the box when it comes to designing a, a recording studio. I've been in so many. <laughs> I love it. Good news. Uh, Ten thousand volts was released February twenty third. You can still pick it up, of course. I know a lot of people are loving this album. Ace Freely, our guest, first time on the show. First time on the Metal Voice. Yeah. In the, in, it's a, in the cavern, I guess, of Ace's cavern. Uh, <laughs> have you seen the lenticular cover? Of the, the new album, you mean? This one. Yeah. Oh. It's got everything. Aliens, That's spaceships. It. The lightning bolts disappear. Oh, I only have the jewel case version, Ace. Oh, yeah. Very nice. I like it a lot. Kmart, I got this. I mean, uh, Walmart only made 2,000 of them. Oh. And I bought 1,000. So uh... <laughs> there's only 1,000 left. Well, I have a confession. <laughs> I bought the other 1,000. Second run because they're sold out in less than a week. So. First question. You know, you made the claim right before it was released. This is going to embarrass Paul and Gene because that's how good this album is. The feedback that you got. I'm sorry? Did I succeed? Did you succeed from all the feedback that you've gotten over this album and the charting that it did? Did yeah. you succeed? <laughs> I think I did. <laughs> all yeah. right. I think you did too. You know, honestly, I, I didn't try to make a great record just to, you know, show them up. Uh, and it was ironic that the album got finished, mixed, and mastered around the time they were retiring, which I don't believe is going to happen. I'm sure they're going to reform in one way or another or with different different people. I think Gene already put together a band and has some shows happening in South America uh, but be that as it may, you know, I, I, I wish them all the very best in any of their new endeavors. Yeah, because we're all brothers in rock and roll. And, you know, we created something really special. And uh, believe it or not, we, we, even though we argue and stuff and disagree, you know, we're still all friends. That's as you sing in Cosmic Heart, life's too short, right? I love that song. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and so it's and the lyrics are pretty much biographical. Yeah, you know, I compare it to Ozzy Osbourne, you know, as ordinary man. It's a, a mature musician looking back on his life. That's a great song, like you said. The lyrics. Yeah. Uh, uh, I made a lot of mistakes. Did too many drugs. Drank too much. I mean, if I wouldn't have gotten sober seventeen years ago, none of this would be here right now. I'd probably be pushing up daisies, you know. <laughs> well, what, uh, you know, looking back, and expect particularly what you spoke about in that song. I mean, what what is some advice you could give some up and coming musicians based on your your vast experience? Practice, practice, and more practice. <laughs> I mean, when I got my first electric guitar, I just practiced all the time, and uh, it paid off. 
Yeah, but it it really depends upon several factors. Number one, I was born into a family where everyone played an instrument. Uh, my mother, father, sister, and brother all played piano. My brother and sister both played acoustic guitar. I mean, my dad was a, a concert pianist. He could play sh Beethoven, Mozart, you know, you name it. And he used to tell me, he used to go, yeah, it doesn't matter what instrument you're playing. He goes, it's all in technique. And I, and I figured that out, you know, several years ago, you know. And that's one of the reasons people cite me as being a major influence, you know, guitar players. Because, you know, I have a certain way that I play. You know, even Tommy Thayer, he, he might play the right notes, but he's not picking it. And his vibrato isn't the same as mine. And it's uh, close, but no cigars. It's all about the feel. <laughs> Whatever. The <laughs> the song Blinded, now you're taking a little bit of a turn and getting into more a political, social topic. I mean, I was that? To, well, I said to Steve, the co-producer, Steve Brown, I said, listen, all, so far, this is about halfway through the record, I think. I said, listen, all the songs are about chicks. So <laughs> I was recently uh, looking at uh, videos on YouTube about the dangers of artificial intelligence and I read some magazines and uh, I mean, believe it or not, you know, more than 35% of the computer scientists and CEOs of companies is, are saying that in five to 10 years, you know, there's a good chance artificial intelligence could turn on us like it has in so many films. Right. Sci-fi films. So, uh, I don't it's know. I, I it's take that one day at a time. You know, I've lived a really full life. If I died tomorrow, you know, I've lived 10 lifetimes. <laughs> Is there anything we can do about it at the end of the day to stop stop that from happening? Uh, well, you know, I have a beautiful fiance I end up going to sleep with, which is nice. Marco. Uh, <laughs> Everybody, have you seen the uh, Cherry Medicine video? Yes, it's a great, yeah, it's great, great song, great song, great song. Yeah, I mean, the really cute uh, brunette with the leopard top is her daughter, and she's the one that's in the tub and sitting next to me on the couch with the cherries on her dress. Yeah, I asked most interviewers, how old do you think she is? They go 30, 35. Well, she's 54. Crazy. And wow. it's because she takes care of herself, and she's... Uh, you know, she works out in the gym. She's a trainer. She drag you along? She's got she's got me doing exercises. Yes. There you go. And it, it's helped me. Yeah. Good, 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 good. It's helped me, and you know, I'm I'm down to 173. Oh yeah. Wow. Five years ago when I went to South America, I was two twenty-four. Ooh. So I don't know, I don't know how much weight that is. How, how tall are you? Six feet, days? Six two. Six wow. two. Oh, two two twenty six two. Okay, one seventy five. You're you're fighting trim now. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much the same weight I was when I did the reunion tour and worked with Kiss. Yeah, I mean, in the early days of Kiss, I was about one sixty, one sixty five. Yes, and then you know, beer, we were, we were all we were all one sixty at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was a beanpole my whole life. I was always skinny, you know. And then I remember one year, uh, maybe three or four years into Kiss, uh, five years, my metabolism changed. And all yeah. of a sudden, I gained 10, 15 pounds, you know, in six months because, you know, I didn't continue. I didn't change my eating habits or drinking habits. And uh... <laughs> Ace, um, I was reading Getty Lee's book, and they, they had. Get, I was reading Getty Lee's book, Getty Lee from Rush, his book, and and he right. just he he outlines in his book what great memories they had Rush when they opened up for Kiss, um, 
do you have any memories from that time with Getty and uh, Neil Peart and, and Alex Lifeson? I mean, I would say more times than not, every night while we were on the road, uh, me and Peter and, and those three guys would end up hanging out and uh, doing stupid stuff. You know, Alex used to put a bag over his head <laughs> joint. Uh, Peter would get up and do his routine. Sometimes I'd do some kind of silly routine. Yeah, I, in those days when I was drinking, I could rattle off 50 or 75 jokes nonstop. <laughs> One right after the other. And for some reason, I can't remember them anymore. <laughs> yeah, uh, that happens. At one point in my life, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian. But, uh, I think it would have been good. And out because I never had the time to do it. Creatures of the Night, you know, that, that style of music where straight ahead, hard rock and music, and then you kind of leave the band at that point. Do you, did you regret it, though? No, thinking. I had already committed to leaving the group and I started looking for band members and stuff and jamming with other people. And pretty much Paul and Gene did everything I said they should have done during the recording of The Elder. You know, and it was just too, too, too late. Too late, I had too late. I made the decision because, you know, I... I could never trust those guys. I don't know what harebrained scheme they'd come up with. I mean, if I was still in the band, I would have never agreed to do these avatars. I mean, you oh, know. Oh, the avatars, yes. It's something like, you know, maybe kids would enjoy, but I don't think, you know, a longtime Kiss fan is going to enjoy that stuff. I mean, I, I wish them well. I, I, I said good luck, but, you know, and... In my humble opinion, you know, I don't think it's going to be uh, a successful endeavor. Hey, one of the songs, Ace, I've been wanting to get your opinion on. It's up in the sky talking about aliens and uh, with the UFO he hearings going on down there in the, what is it, Congress uh, or Senate? Uh, is, is it fact or fiction, as you ask in the song? Originally, it was called Fact or Fiction, and then Steve suggested uh, a different title. You know, but, you know, most of the music and lyrics were already written, and uh, Steve came up with some good ideas, and uh, it became up in the sky. You know, and Steve came up with that high part at the end. What? Well, you know? And, I mean, do you... I mean, do you me and it? Steve work really well together, and uh, I got aggravated the other day because I, 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 I heard that you know people were saying I didn't write any of the songs on the record, and it was all Steve Brown, and uh, and then, you know Steve, he was doing three sides of the coin, and you know. He, he kind of confirmed that by saying, yeah, uh, the guy said, well, how much did Ace bring to the table? And he goes, well, I pretty much brought about 97%. And I was really shocked when he said that because that's not the case. And I called him up and he apologized to me. You know, he's a, he's a wonderful guy. I love him, you know. He was so excited about the record and they were asked some questions that weren't rehearsed. He wasn't, he had no idea. So, you know, everybody sometimes toots their own horn a little more than they should sometimes without thinking, you know, and he was so excited about the record, you know, he made that statement, but he, he admitted to me last night, you know, that, that, that wasn't the case, you know, when I brought up up in the sky and, uh, Several other things, you know. I mean, what's that one song that everybody's jumping on bandwagon now? Uh, Fighting for Life. Oh, Saying yes. One of the best songs on the record. You know, I rewrote the whole chorus for that. You know, I mean, you know, I'm I'm a very good lyricist. I always have been. But, you know, when it, when it came to this album, I... If, if Steve brought, brought a song to me with lyrics, you know, 
ultimately I ended up rewrite rewriting at least fifty percent of the lyrics, you know, just because so, I'm a bit of lyricist, and I think he'd be the first one to admit that. But he's definitely a much better engineer and, and producer than I am, and he's a great guitar player, and good songwriter and very knowledgeable on Pro Tools, much more so than myself, you know? I like to give credit where credit's due. So so would you say it was like a 50-50? You both collaborated 50-50 on we, it? We just decided no matter how much one of us brought to the table, we were gonna split everything in half, you know? Because uh, it's a lot easier doing it that way than, because, you know, I don't need that, you know, I don't need the money that bad. And, you know, I know Steve worked really hard because not only did he co-produce it, but he engineered the whole record himself. Yeah. And uh, I didn't have to pay for an engineer, so that saved me thousands of dollars. And uh, we just, you know, whatever one guy brought to the table or the other guy, it really didn't matter. It was, to me, the most important thing is the end result, you know? I sang lead on all of on all the songs. I played guitar solos on eighty percent of the songs, seventy five percent. A couple of solos that uh, he came up with, they were guide solos for me to copy. And I said, you know, Steve, those solos are so good. Let's just leave them. You know, he goes, well, I don't want any credit. <laughs> yeah, I'm humble. And I said. I'm going to give you credit because, you know, I like to give credit where credit is due. I don't want to take a credit for your solo if I didn't write it. So, you know, that's the kind of relationship we have. And, uh, you know, it really doesn't matter who came up with what first. I always end up acifying it. That's right. <laughs> Putting my stamp on it. You know, you can't get away from my voice. The minute you hear my voice, you know it's Ace Frehley. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, and I, I know, thanks for second setting the record straight. I mean, yeah. yeah. So did he? Did he claim he wrote ninety percent, ninety seven percent of it, or did he? Did, is that what you said I, before? He said, "I think that you know how questions can be a little deceiving." He said, yes. "Well, how much did Ace really write?" And he said, "Well." I, you know, we did a cover song, which was my idea, uh, a song by Nadia called Life of a Stranger, which turned out great. And uh, I wrote. Uh, uh, Walking on the Moon. Song, the fifth song on the record. Oh, yeah. Back in my arms again. Back in my, yeah, I wrote that 20, uh, 35 years ago or something, you know, uh, with Arthur Stead. You know, and, you know, whenever, you know, when he brought me Walking on the Moon, it was, there was one line in the chorus called Walking on the Moon, but it wasn't the crux of the top of the chorus. And I said, this song has to be called Walking on the Moon. He came over to my house and we worked it up and I rewrote most of the lyrics and uh, turned out great. And, you know, it as far as I'm concerned, it really doesn't matter who does what, as long as the end result is is what I want and what Steve wants. And, you know, we're always on the same page for the most part. Of course, we'd have our differences, you know, from time to time. I mean, he wrote a song, and I can't remember which one it was. Uh, he brought a song to me, and, and it was kind of finished. But it was like a drum machine, you know, and I wanted to bring in a different drummer and uh, change a few things on it. And uh, I said, this song needs a bridge. And he said, no, nah, it doesn't need a bridge. I said, trust me, it needs a bridge. I've been writing songs for 50. <laughs> I wrote a bridge in 10 minutes and, and I we inserted it after the second chorus. And he goes, wow, that's really good. So, you know, that's the way we worked. And we, you know, Ace, whatever he is... brought, I added to, took away, uh, did a guitar solo on it, sang it. We didn't use any auto tuning, like some people are saying. I have perfect pitch, so 
I can tell if I'm singing flat. I just redo it, you know. And it's such a positive sounding album. What's it like? You know, is you because your your new love life? Uh, is it what's your state of mind these days? It's a, it's a combination of actually me and Steve are like soulmates too. I mean, I'm soulmates with my fiance Lara, and she actually sang on "Constantly Cute." She sang on the pre-chorus and the chorus. Uh, and, uh, you know, Steve was asked on, in this other interview, did you do all the backgrounds? He goes, yeah, I did all the backgrounds. Of course, he forgot that my fiance sang on backgrounds on one song. But, you know, it was, it was just one of those things where he w wasn't thinking 100% on point. And, uh, I called him up and he apologized and he said, look, I'm going to, my next few interviews, I'm going to try to undo what I said that wasn't 100% accurate. So that's all. Yeah, we, well, I still want to work with him in the future because he's a great engineer and we get things done. And, and a great sounding album too. So congrats to both of you. Yeah, okay. and you know, Steve was the guy who, who found the, uh, the mixer and, and guy who mastered the record. And every time I talk about it, I can't remember his name. I mean, it might say it on here somewhere, but on the. <laughs> Ace, to follow up to Alan's question, do you really believe in aliens? Is this, is this, is this something oh, yeah. that you believe in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen UFOs multiple times. Yeah, I we're, think we're past, we're past the point that if they exist, they, we I think we've proven that they do exist. But you I believe mean, in this? You think if it came out that the whole world would be in a panic that they seem so, so seem to be worried look, about? They've already done polls, and more than fifty percent of the population believes in aliens. So I don't think it would be that big a shock. And and you know that whole thing about well. If an alien ship landed somewhere and aliens walked out, every you know would throw off the idea of religion. I don't buy that. Is you know, God could have created aliens as well, and uh, on a different planet, and they ended up making it to here. It could have been the other way around. I mean, look, we're starting to go we've been to the moon. You know, we we landed rovers on the on Mars. You know. So uh, we're always, our telescopes are always on the lookout for planets that might sustain life that are in that sweet spot rotating around the sun. So, uh, I mean, for us to believe in a universe this size with billions, maybe trillions of planets, we're the only one that has life on it, that's pretty ridiculous, I think. I think so too. Planet Gendel. Gendel. Where did that rumor come from? Gendel? Oh, Gendel. my friend in high school came up with that, and I just kind of used it once I became a stage fan. <laughs> I used to joke around while I was drunk. I go, Yeah, I'm from I'm from Planet Gendel. Jimmy yeah. Jimmy remembers that from his youth. He's still he's still being a, the kiss factor. Well, I mean, there was a lot of myths, right? Gene Simmons had his tongue sewn, right? There was a piece of his tongue that those were the no. myths that were going around. No, right? what, 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 ha what Gene did, and he told me, he said he went, when he was at the dentist, you know, that little piece of oh, yeah. skin that ha uh, hang connects you. He said he had a clip so his tongue could stick out more. You know, he didn't add a piece to his tongue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you know, Knights and Satan service, people used to say that's what Kiss stood for. I mean, the... It's amazing what people can imagine, you know, if their, you know, imagination runs wild, you know? Yeah. And uh, I'm used to it. I mean, you know, we they used to burn our b albums in the South, you know, during in the Bible Belt. You know, Kiss was like, you know, and, and you know, it only made us bigger. <laughs> but kids would sneak the albums into their room anyway, you know, and have a, a, a somebody else buy for them. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it's just like when you have a movie that's R-rated, you know, younger kids who aren't allowed to go see it want to see it more. 
Yeah. So, more, you exactly. know, it's, did, it, it's really psychology. Did, and, did you know when, 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 when Alive was mixed in or sort of redone in the studio, did you, were you aware that Gene and the rest of the gang were kind of working on it or touching it up? Sort of adding a lot. A lot of it was touched up. <laughs> a lot. Did you know though? Did you know of it? <laughs> at least fifty percent of it was resung and replayed. I mean, and I remember Eddie Kramer had loops of tape going around microphone stands, going back into these two-inch tape machine, quarter-inch tape machines. And each one had a different, he had three faders and they were dedicated to crowd response. Yeah, yeah, and one was really crazy. One was mid midway and one was more subtle. And he, you know, it, it was, uh, I mean, if you listen closer to the album, you can hear that it's faked in, in, in many play. I mean, I didn't fake my live guitar solo. You know, that was real. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes you, you sing off key a little. In those days, you, we didn't have auto-tune. So, you know, if Paula Jean, Peter, or myself sang something a little off, you know, we'd re-sing it in the studio. Yeah, we just wanted to put out the best product possible. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, today in the studio... That stuff like that is done without even a thought, you know? Yeah. And there's so many groups today that are performing live and have backing tracks, not just Kiss. Plenty of other groups. And I don't want to yeah. name them because I know them and they're friends of mine. <laughs> I'd rather not spill the beans. I don't want to, you know, disappoint the fans. But, yeah, I... I there's a lot I know because I know everybody and I know en I know engineers and guys who do sound for these bands and they tell me the real deal. But, you know, it used to be like a big a, a big crime to do that. I mean, you remember when Millie Vanilli got like booted yeah. oh, they got the label because they were found that they were lip syncing. You know, well, you know, things change over the years. You know, now it's Except that, you know, yeah. I mean, I remember reading comments on a Kiss, about Kiss Live, and, and people will say, well, you know, Paul Stanley's been singing great for over 50 years, you know, give the guy a break. Uh, no, 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 no. I, if I if I lost my voice and I couldn't hit the notes, I'd hire a lead singer or have somebody else in the band sing. You know, I don't believe in having backup tracks because I'm too spontaneous. I change songs in the middle of the halfway through. You know, <laughs> that, you know the tempo isn't always the same. You know, when you have a, a pre-recorded show, the tempo and the length of the show is always exactly the same length. And people were, you know, people were timing the length of the set, and it was down to the second. So, be that as it may, you know, some people got hoodwinked. Some people asked for their money back, and they got it. Believe it or not. <laughs> actually, Millie Vanilli. I was working in a record store. Yeah. They actually allowed people to give back the albums of Millie Vanilli, and they would get credited for the album. So people would come into the store and give back their Millie Vanilli album that was, wow. you know, yeah, and they got credited for them too. The label would take wow. them back. Yeah, that's how. That's how, it, it was a crime. Uh, well, it crime, was unfortunate, but. you know. I th those, I think those guys were talented. They just didn't have the pro right people around them guiding them, and it, you know, and somehow it came out. Oh. But yeah. yeah if they're still alive, you know, they're probably looking at the music scene today and realizing, you know, what they did wasn't so bad. Yeah. <laughs> Especially yeah, today. Even Part for I, the course today. I, I, you know, I would never do it, but, you know, a lot of people do. I think, you know, when people come and pay good money to see a live band, they should see a live band, yeah. period. Yeah, I agree. Did did you regret when Peter was when voted out of the band? 
you know, you, you decided that you too would vote him out. Did you regret have not having that ally with you? Yeah. And after he was gone, I realized I lost all my power with Kiss because uh, we were a democratic group. And nine times out of 10, when Peter was in the band, he'd vote with me and Paul and Jim would vote another way. And then Bill O'Coin was the tiebreaker. Like he was like the fifth kiss. And uh, a lot of times, you know, Bill would vote with me and Peter. You know, a lot of times Paul and Jim came up with these most ridiculous ideas. And I, I'd have to say, you know, because they weren't street smart. You know, Jim grew up in Israel, you know, and Paul wasn't, he lived in Queens, but he wasn't the kind of guy like me who grew up in the Bronx and hung out at the corner candy store. I had my pulse on the street and what people wanted. And I, I was like that through my whole life. So, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, they would want to do certain things. And I'd say, guys, you can't do that. It's not cool. <laughs> yeah. I saved them several times. I didn't even need to get into what the subject matter was. But, you know, they just didn't have a grasp of what was going on with the kids at the time. I mean, look at the elder. I mean, all they had to do was go, you know, ask around and look at the music scene. And everybody's coming out with hard rock, heavy metal albums. And we're going to come out with this silly fucking concept record. Uh, At what point did Gene... It didn't make any sense to me. Where did they lose focus, Gene and Paul? Like, at what point? Like, because they were on fire. First three, four albums, they were on fire, right? As musicians, as visionaries, as songs. I think... I don't know. They haven't put out a record in 20 years. Something up with that. You know, I've done five or six records at this juncture, besides yeah. my solo album in 78 and the Fraley's Comet records. So it's just, uh, I keep chugging along, doing what I want to do, when I want to do it. It's nice being my own boss, because those guys were really control freaks. So that's one of the main reasons I left the band. Yeah. And I, I used to hate it when they would... Uh, say they fired me because that was such a crock of shit you know every time I, every time i quit they'd ask me to stay <laughs> yeah. well that's one of the you... questions i had for you ace you know with, with gina paul's history as they call it their version is is that too entrenched for you to kind of say hey guys that's not quite what happened or is it or is people just believe the 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 I narrative never over... the, i never read it i, I never gave a shit yeah, for some reason, I mean, to be totally honest, I, it's hard for me me to verbalize what those guys, working with those guys was like. But they took Kiss so fucking seriously. And, you know, for me, I thought Kiss was a great vehicle and a great concept. And, uh, you know, we designed our own makeup and costumes in the beginning. And uh, I just took it, you know, as one day at a time. Yeah. And then I remember once Gene got this bug up his ass to start merchandising every fucking thing under the sun. I'll never forget Bill O'Coin uh, came over to me right before a concert. He said, hey, do me a favor. Don't curse <laughs> during the show if you can help it, because his five year old kids with lunch boxes. <laughs> Now, yeah, you might lose the lunchbox. I realized at that point I realized something was a little off. This isn't what I signed on for, <laughs> and you know, between that and the success of my solo album, uh, you know, mine was the most successful out of the four. And uh, I realized at that juncture in my career, I was more creative away from Paul, Gene, and Peter than I was with them. You know, it reminds me of that show that you were on with Gene and Paul. I can't remember who the host was, where you're just laughing and Tom laughing. Tom Snyder. And laughing. Oh, yeah, Tom, Tom Snyder. Snyder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, what was going through your mind? I mean, you could see Gene I was and Paul. drunk. 
I, but was trying, didn't well, tell us. I, I had done a little blow, so that kind of <laughs> bounced me out. With and your space bear, space teddy bear. Did you get in shit everything after the I show? Said, everything I said in that show was all spontaneous. Nothing was <laughs> planned. The plumber joke and all that stuff, that just came to me at the moment. <laughs> and you were supposed to be the quiet one. I'm a one. funny guy, you know? <laughs> I just come up with ridiculous things. Sometimes I'll be sitting somewhere and just start laughing because I think funny things in my head, you know? I, yeah, I used to be. I used to say to people, "Give me a six pack of beer and lock me in a closet, and I'll be happy as a pig in shit." You know? <laughs> did, they, did they put you on a timeout after that? Like after that show? Like what did they tell you? Like what are you doing, Ace? What are you doing? They disappeared. They never came over and congratulated me for doing a great show and being so hysterical. The only person who knocked on my kept knocking on my. Uh, yeah. Door, what's it called? Dressing room? Dressing room door, yeah. yeah. I'm a little burnt, so you got to bear with me. <laughs> uh, it was Tom Snyder. He wanted to, he, he had so much fun. He goes, I got to meet this guy, you know? So I took my makeup off real quick and I, and I invited him in the dressing room and we just started laughing. And he goes, you know, you're a really funny guy. And I said, yeah, I've been told that before. I, I actually was told that by John Belushi, a professional comedian. Yeah, professional comedian, yeah. I was hanging out with John for, you know, six to eight months prior to his him passing. And we got pretty close. We used to go on three-day coke runs. <laughs> I would always crack him up. And he used to say to me, Ace, you're one of the few people that can make me laugh. You know, he's a professional comedian. Yeah. But, you know, he just thought I was a fucking character. And uh, I'd some, he'd say something and I'd come back with something and he'd crack up. And he actually said to me before he left to get go on the plane to California, uh, he said, you're definitely going to be in my next film. Oh, there you go. Never happened. But we know we all know what happened. Yeah. Wow. So wasn't meant to be, and uh, I'm still funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think that's 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 Ace. You know the 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 sort of unique voice, the great guitar tone and playing, and the spirit of rock and roll, right? And you know yeah. the humor, right? And I think that's why all the fans, you know, always gravitated towards you. And people shouldn't take rock and roll so seriously. It's just an art form. And as far as I'm concerned, when I'm out performing live, I just want to make people happy. You know, if, if people get up off their feet and have a good time and, for two, you know, for an hour and a half, two hours, they forget about the, the shit that's going on in their lives. And I, I've accomplished my job. Yeah. And you know, that's the way I look at it. And I, I've never taken rock and roll super seriously. You know, I, I was always a, a really good graphic artist. I knew I had that to fall back on. I knew I could have probably been a stand-up comedian, you know, if I really got some good training from some other comedians and had people writing jokes for me. I know how to deliver them. And, uh, but, you know, the way things turned out, you know, I, I, I'm in a great place right now. I, I got a, a very successful record, more so than anything I've done in the past. And uh, I got a new agent who's booking me some great shows. Uh, I got a great woman behind me. They say behind yeah. every great man is a great woman. I have a great woman behind me. And I got a great co-producer. Co and uh, life's life's good. Oh, yeah. good. Good. I'm happy to hear I that. Think, That's it. I think we'll leave it at that, Ace. So thanks for your time. And just coming right from the Space Ace's basement, his recording studio in his basement. It was a pleasure speaking to you today. Ten thousand volts. I'd just like to say hi to all my fans in Canada. Sorry, I haven't been up there in a while, but you know, I have this passport issue. But once that's cleared up, I'll be up in Canada. 
I love playing Canada. You know, it's a gas. You know, and uh, I really miss performing in Europe as well. But you know, next summer I'll probably be doing all the festivals. So I have that to look forward to. And right. I got a ton of shows booked. You know, this summer and into the fall. So I'm gonna be a busy beaver. <laughs> last Good. here's the last question. The last question. I, you I don't know how many years ago it's been now. 50 years. You walked into the studio room on this audition to kiss. And I guess Bob Kulik was there. Actually, he was before you. You walk right in. Did you think your life would turn out the way it has all those years later? Well, I can tell you from age 16, I always saw me becoming a famous rock star. And I always knew it was going to happen. If it didn't happen with Kiss, it would have happened with somebody else. You know, because I knew I had the image, I had the looks, I had the chops, and I was tall and thin. And, you know, I found out later on I could actually sing too. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was, all right. uh, it was crazy, but... I kind of knew it was all going to happen. It it happened. It took longer to happen than I anticipated, though. You know, everybody thinks Kiss made it overnight. You know, we had three albums prior to Alive right. that did so so. You know, but once Alive hit, you know, we came out with this great package, and it was basically a souvenir of a, our live concert, and that's something the first three albums never caught, captured. You know, because we're really more of a live band. Uh, we're a spectacle with all the special effects and, you know, what have you. Confetti, rockets, fire, bombs going off. So, you know, the Alive album really captured that. And I think that's what made people gravitate towards that record. And uh, from that point on, we were playing arenas all over the place. And life got good. There's no All looking right. back after that. Listen, catch Ace on tour, pick up his album, 10,000 Volts. It's probably one of his best solo albums. There it is. Oh, you can the... pick up the lenticular cover. There it is. Or that Maybe one. When I, when I'm on if you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ace, I'm been a pleasure. I'm selling them on, on cut when I perform live, so you can pick All it right. up. All right. There you go. Looking perform. forward to it. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Hey, it was Thanks. such a pleasure talking to you guys. A lot of fun. This is my last interview for the day, so uh, I think I'm going to go jump in my Jaguar and take a spin. There you go. <laughs> Enjoy the day. All right, bye. <laughs>